Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and joining me today again is my friend, the Reverend Dr. Matt Richard. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you, Harrison. It's good to see you too, man. I hear you got a snowstorm going on. Yeah, I just, I, I took my camera up here and I twist it up. If I do it, I'll mess it all up again. But uh, out the window, I, I think we have yeah, about this much. So about five, that's uh, what, about five inches, four or five inches of snow so far. I think we have 10 to go. Uh, it's fluff. It looks fluffy. I haven't been out yet. So that means, um, you know, it'll be easy to drive in, but it compacts it down and turns to ice. And so, I don't know, I'll get some hot chocolate and, uh, yeah, it's, sure it's, milk and eggs before I go home and we'll, uh, bundle up. It'll be good. So the Dakotas are, the Dakotas are ready for this. It'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. um, it's 70 degrees here and I'm actually kind of jealous. Um, <laughs> I think I'm ready for it. We can do it. Um, get all the leaves off of my deck first, and then we'll go for it. So uh, today we're going to sort of talk about um, the, the what does Jesus have to say about? And we were kicking around sort of what to call it, but how does Jesus say we're supposed to talk about our neighbor might even be the best way to talk about it? Yeah. I mean, boy, this this opens it up so many different ways. In fact, we, we talked about this at confirmation last night as well. How do we talk about each other? How do we talk about you know, our neighbor when it's kind of easy when things are going well, right? I mean, when mm-hmm. something's going well in our neighbor, we can speak well, but then our, our simple nature begins to covet. And then we sometimes what, uh, not sometimes we, we do it. We, we, we take and we spin the narrative and we speak neg- negatively about our neighbor when things are going good. That's obviously breaking the eighth commandment, not speaking kindly. But when things are going bad, um, I mentioned to you before, I, I've seen this many times where something's going bad in a person's life. Sometimes we can overly sugarcoat it where then we take something that's sinful that's happening in the public sphere that everyone sees. And then we, we, we spin it with uh, an eight commandment ish way. And we, 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 we paint that which is sinful as good and glorious. And so mm-hmm. we're, we're speaking not correctly about a thing and about a situation. Does that make sense? I mean, I... yeah. So, I mean, there, there's sort of two extremes to this, right? So um, the, the, the eighth commandment is given Luther in the large catechism. He says something really, really insightful. It's Luther. I guess that's not surprising, but he says, we, we use our words to try and produce justice in the world that we can't otherwise get. And so if, if the judge won't come along and declare the criminal guilty, I'm going to ruin their reputation. Um, and in the same way that there's somebody that, that I, I care for somebody in my tribe, somebody I love who's being knocked around by the world, I will try and use my words to, to lift them up. And we can do this in a way that. um, well, it stops being godly. Uh, you've sort of, you've seen this where, um, you know, uh, there, there's, uh, I, I see it a lot with, with grandkids. Um, so grandparents have nothing bad to say about their grandkids ever. And it's right, right. fine when they're, you know, yay tall and cute. But once they sort of hit the teenage years um, and, and they, they start doing the weird stuff, uh, once they, they, they sort of hit the young adult stage and they have that rocky patch, you can still listen to the grandparents have absolutely nothing bad to say about them. And we love our neighbor. We want to use our words for, for good, but at the same time, like, honey, he just stole a car. Like he, he, he's not just sort of, he, he's not just sort of a little confused about things. Like we, we actually need to address that. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess that's, yeah. Thank you for helping out on that. I mean, as far as how, how would Jesus have us speak? And I would say that we speak the truth in love, right? We hear that mm-hmm. in Ephesians, you know, speak the truth. So it's like, it's maybe, what does it mean to speak the truth in love? It would be like looking at that neighbor who stole a car. Um, you would have to use the label of, you know, thievery, um, stealing. And we have to point, yeah, we'd have to point to one of the commandments. We can't, we can't negate that, uh, that, that, that this person did steal that car and that is sinful. It's wrong. It's breaking a commandment of uh, thou shalt not steal. It's not respecting thy neighbor's possessions, but then perhaps we could say, well, we're speaking the truth, but then to do it in love, which would still then be to put the best construction on it saying, you know what, to, to go and steal a car, a person must be what very, very, you know, desperate or needing of finances or something must be going on in their life that is such calamity and such a struggle that they would have to go to such extreme to do something of that extreme uh, to make to make some money for themselves. And so um, even if if you look at like, let's just take, for instance, the 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 uh, drug addict uh, person who is struggling with drugs, um, you know, obviously we would say that that is abusing the body, right? Fifth commandment, thou shalt not murder. It's, 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 it's an abuse in the body. But then why would a person, you know, uh, set out to take drugs? I mean, I've, I've encountered people who've struggled with meth over the years 
And I remember one couple, uh, boy, they were struggling with meth and just, just seeing what the physical uh, problems that did and how it started to rot their teeth out and the, the mental problems that they had, uh, the struggle with their body. You could just see this methamphetamines and what it was doing to destroy their body. And I don't think anybody says, you know what, I'm going to start doing meth so I can what rot my teeth out and destroy my body. I mean, we, we don't typically sin it's in order to, thing, I don't think. Yeah. Right. We, we typically don't sin to actually destroy a marriage. We don't sin to destroy our body and end up dead at 35 years old. I mean, we just don't do that. So the compassionate approach is, yeah, you know, doing methamphetamines is breaking the fifth commandment. Stealing a car is breaking a commandment of thou shalt not steal. But then maybe the compassionate approach is why? And the answer would be, there must be some sort of pain, some sort of sin, either that they committed or that was committed against them that has driven them to a great deal of despair or depression or guilt or pain. And they're trying to compensate with that and they just don't know how. So it leads them to do these irrational or uh, destructive patterns in their life. So then we can look at our neighbor and call it a sin and yet show compassion at the same time, speaking the truth in love. Right. So uh, we, we always try and justify our sin. So I'll come up with a reason why it made sense at the time after the fact, but very rarely does sin actually make logical sense. It hurts. It breaks stuff. And quite frankly, um, if you want to live in this, this world, stop poking holes in it and it'll last longer. longer. Um, but when it comes to this, uh, we, we, we see our neighbors, the ones that we love, and we see them hurting. We see the things that break. We see the sin. Um, and more often than not, when we try and say, I'm going to speak the truth in love, by love, we mean, how can I diminish the law? But love doesn't diminish the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law, so says our Lord. And so to look at this then, um, it, it's not to sort of excuse or justify their sin, but to let Jesus be the justification of their sin. And then recognizing this isn't just a destructive force set loose, loose on the universe, but this is somebody that Jesus died for. How can I, how can I love them? Where are they hurting? And, and where in my vocation can I, can I help? Yeah. And I mean, this all comes back to, to taking the plank out of your own eye. I love that. Right. You know, Jesus yeah. says, if you see um, that speck in your neighbor's eye, you know, uh, take it out of your own eye and so forth. In other words, uh, he's not saying don't judge. And I think that's oftentimes the the verses, you know, Jesus says, uh, do not judge lest ye be judged. Uh, there, there you go. You know, right. Jesus says, don't judge. Um, no, you, you are to judge. Um, we need to judge one another, um, but we don't do it hypocritically. We don't do it without self-examination first. So in other words, what this would look like is if you see a neighbor struggling, whatever it might be, uh, let's just say it's cheating on test, right? Then, then it would be, okay, well, how have I cheated in school or cheated at work? Well, you know, the other day, let's just say, I, you know, I, I, I put in a full day's work, but I, I maybe operated at 60%. I drug my feet a little bit. I didn't give 100%. So I, I technically, I cheated my boss out of his wages, right? And so then we go to our neighbor who is cheating in on a schoolwork or a test or whatever it might be, and just say, hey, I've noticed this is going on. Tell you what, I get it. I mean, I, I've been there too, and, and I struggle with that. And and it's an ongoing temptation for me too. You know, it, it's it, it's life is tough. It gets difficult and finding time to study and do all these things and get overwhelmed. So you just kind of take the easy way out. But this is going to come back to bite you. Can how how can I talk? How can I talk with you? How can we work through this? And then how can we uh, ultimately seek repentance, uh, admitting that this is wrong, calling a thing what it is, but then both together hearing Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and then praying for his strength and his might, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to walk uh, in good works that he said in advance for us to walk in. I love it. And our liturgy kind of helps with this. So I know that sort of the, the corporate confession and absolution that we do on Sunday morning, it's a pretty new thing in sort of the grand scheme of, of what it is to be a church service. But at the same time, I love it because we start church off and all of my excuses for my sins, they're, they're thrown right out the window. And all I have before Jesus is, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you. Um, and you're right, there, there is trying harder. And you're right, they're sort of examining all of those things. But the, the, the way that I'm going to start is going to be first and foremost, I need Jesus for this. And at the same time, I get to hear my neighbor too. And it, there's no diminishing the law at this point in time. It is completely fulfilled. It, it is, this is what the standard is. None of us have lived up to it. It's not just that my neighbor is a sinner and I can sort of look down on them, but Lord have mercy on me. I also am a sinner and I've broken that number of commandments too. 
And now that he has given us this wonderful gift of absolution, when we're tied together in this vocation, first and foremost, we get to look at each other as those for whom Christ has died and risen again. We are the baptized so that when we, we start, it, it's you're right. There's no judging in that. I want to see you condemned for this. I want to see both of us forgiven. Um, but then it, it's it's actually the, the wonderful part about the blind leading the blind. It says, you know, um, well, wouldn't wouldn't it be great if nobody fell into the pit or, or you know, if, if it's your neighbor has a speck first deal with the log in your own eye. And that's not so that you can leave your neighbor with the speck in theirs, but it's so that you can, you can help your neighbor. Um, but, but the source of this mercy, it's, it's Christ who forgives all of the sinners. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, back to confession and absolution. I, I've, I've said this time and time and time again at St. Paul's when we uh, confess our sins at the beginning of the divine service, I tell them to take note, where do I stand? I stand on the floor. Now we have our, our, our floor at St. Paul's and we have a couple steps up and then we have a couple more steps up again up to the altar. Uh, so there's a risingness, if you will, of, of the sanctuary. But when it comes to confession of sin, I don't stand up at the altar with my notepad and look out and it's like, ah, oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, right, right. Yep, good, good, yep, yeah, good, good. I'm, I'm not up there looking at them. I'm on the floor. My feet are on the same floor, same level as them. I'm the chief of sinners of this church confessing, taking the lead, confessing my sin, that I need grace just as much as my parishioners, if not more. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just I, I, I get to go up and place my hand on that baptismal font that we have, place my hand on that baptismal font, and I raise my other hand, and I say, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you of all of your sins. And I get to see my parishioners smile when the gospel comes forth and it gets poured into their ears. I get to see their disposition stand up. I get to see them smile because they are forgiven in Jesus. And so again, that forgiveness only happens when we call a thing what it is. And when we confess sin for what it is, uh, because when there's not that confession, then we really say, we're really saying we don't need the gospel. Yeah. And so it's important again, for us to call a thing what it is in our neighbor, but also in ourselves equally, which creates humility in ourselves towards our neighbor and then what I've heard this before, I just love this, that, that, that we're just two beggars going to receive free warm bread. I love it. Uh, and just together, let's go get warm bread together as beggars, equally receiving free bread from Jesus, the forgiveness yeah. of sins. So we don't talk about our neighbor like they don't need Jesus, but we also don't talk like, talk about our neighbor like they don't already have Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. Well put. Wonderful. Pastor, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, it's good to see you, Harrison. You too. Take care, friend. Be safe out there. Thanks, bud.